And the common denominator in all of the negativity was me. Mm -hmm. And so I looked myself in the mirror and I said, like all of these random strange things are happening to me. I got to change me. And I made a commitment to God in that moment that I was going to bring in as much light as I possibly could. I'd heard about this concept called light, that a person emits light, that a person could have so much light within them that they can be anointed by God. They glow that when they walk into a room, good things happen. And I knew about it conceptually. And I said, okay, I'm, I was privileged enough to have a beautiful home, beautiful environment. I had a person to help take care of me and cook for me and things like that. And so I said that I was going to make it my full-time job to learn how this thing called the light works and to try to bring as much of that into my life as possible. You are listening to the Aligned and Alive podcast with Chrissy May, where we discuss the various aspects of spirituality and wellness, a place where you can find guidance and a space to explore your life's meaning and purpose, allowing you to become connected, aligned, and feeling fully alive. Joining us today is an incredible human being who has experienced it all from rock bottom to rock star. Ryan Blair is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Nothing to Lose, everything to gain and a serial entrepreneur. Blair went from a gang member to a businessman with over $2 billion in company sales. Blair is the former CEO of Vice Dallas, which is known for the Body by Vi 90 day challenge. In 2012, Blair sold Vice Dallas for a whopping $792 million. After hitting rock bottom several times and discovering his life purpose, other than being a great dad, he began his latest company, Alter Call, which uplifts and helps entrepreneurs scale their companies using spiritual modalities, helping millions of people alter their lives to become the greatest leaders and human beings possible. So we can change the world. Blair has been featured in Forbes, Dr. Phil, and LA Style, to name a few, and guest appeared on notable podcasts such as Tony Robbins, Lewis Howes, and David Metzler. It is an honor and privilege to share and sit in conversation today with Ryan Blair. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I have been looking forward to this all week, binging on YouTube videos from just your career throughout the years and interviews you've had and your story of trials and triumphs. I mean, you've experienced every high and low imaginable, it seems, with the high of seemingly high of Isalis to yeah. the very challenging and painful period with your son's autism. And of course, the heartbreaking low with your mom and her health, her passing, which I can completely empathize with. It's very difficult to lose a parent as as I've shared with you the passing of my father a month ago. So your story is just incredible. It's moving. You've done it all. If you wouldn't mind just kind of taking us down the short version, because I really want to dive deeper into this beautiful movement that you've created, which is Alter Call. So just kind of take us down your life's journey, if you wouldn't mind. No, my story is one that's been filled with a lot of adversity. I'm actually grateful for that now. But when I look back at it, you know, I started in the middle class. My dad was an engineer and he was a very smart man. My mother was a homemaker, a very beautiful woman. I was uh, brought into the family. I'm the youngest of seven, right when my dad was accelerating in his career. So we were moving up. We moved into a new house. In fact, my parents had bought a home. We put in a pool. So my early memories were very middle class and upper middle class in comparison to the neighborhood that I lived in, not by the standards of today. But at those days, if you made $100,000 a year, that was a big deal. So my earliest memories memories. I had, you know, come school time. I had wonderful presents, you know, whatever bike I wanted. And life was great, at least on the outside. But on the inside, my dad was a very violent person. My mom was an alcoholic. My brothers and sisters all rebelled and they went through some very difficult times. I was the youngest. So I didn't start getting beat up too bad until I was a little bit, you know, like maybe seven, eight years old, but I would still take a lot of belts, but it wasn't <laughs> extremely bad. And then my dad uh, started doing harder drugs. Drugs were always around though. I marijuana as part of my household. Like we grew it. I used to steal it from my dad and give it to the neighbors and alcohol and, and that type of stuff. But when my dad got addicted to methamphetamines, he started changing. He ended up having a psychotic 
break, thought that I was, you know, the enemy, basically. He started targeting me and threatening me. And so I had to flee. At about 13 years old, I left and I lived in a converted turkey coop. My mom stayed with my dad at the time, so I was on my own basically at 13. And a principal found out about my condition because I had lice all the time. And every time they'd come check your head, they'd pull me out of class and the principal was like, what's going on with you? And I said, I live in a rat infested shack. The principal said, where are your parents? And I said, I don't have any parents. And that's what started the process of my mother being forced to leave my father and for me to go from the middle class to poverty. Now, when that happened, I got really angry. I was angry at my father and I was angry at the way society treats you when you're poor. When you're in the middle class, you're treated very well. But when you're poor, even the teachers treat you differently. Like they know that your parents aren't likely to be able to sue or whatever it is. So mm. teachers treat you differently. The kids in school treat you differently. The police officers certainly treat you differently. Like they're looking for reasons to take you down. And so I got really angry at society. I got angry at God. I got angry at my, my mom and dad, and I rebelled and joined a, joined a gang. The age of about 14 until 17, I was heavily involved in a gang. We're talking drive-by shootings, terrorizing people, doing terrible things, drug dealing, um, all kinds of different rackets. I was uh, heading to prison. Uh, by the grace of God, a judge granted me leniency and told me that he thought I had the capacity to go to college one day. He said, son, you should be writing in college, not in prison, because I wrote him a letter. Uh, he let me out. And the irony of it is, is, is prior to that, and I was just reflecting on this recently, I was in solitary confinement in the jail and I only had a Bible in my hand. I couldn't read very well because I had attention deficit disorder, so I'd always lose track, but I could read out loud and I would read out loud this Bible. And now today I you know, teach people spirituality, but that's just a glimpse of it. By 17 years old, I had a mentor come into my life by way of my mother and he was an entrepreneur. And I saw the way he operated. I thought to myself, all of these teachers and police officers and everyone who said I would never amount to anything. All of the neighbors in the middle class, my father, all the kids on the streets that made fun of me for going from the middle to poverty. Well, they don't know about this class. They don't know about the wealthy class. And I'd never seen wealth before. So I just basically made a really naive decision. I said, well, if I have a choice to be poor, to be in the middle or to be rich, I'll just choose to be rich. It was a simple choice for me. And that choice basically was made when I was 19 years old and I was wealthy by the time I was 25 years old. And during that time, did you, I'm curious, did you have any sort of spiritual practice at all or was it just straight I'm, I'm in it for the money and I'm excited to get out of the space that I'm in right now. When I reflect back on it, I think God was guiding me the entire time. I didn't know that. I thought it was coincidence or I thought it was luck. But when you look at the pattern now, the judge granting me leniency, and that was an odd thing. And, and then a multimillionaire mentor comes into my life and rescues this street kid and gives my mother a Cinderella story. And I basically go from living in poverty and gang ridden environment to now I'm you know living on the water in a mansion. And he takes me in as his apprentice. And I then discover I have an aptitude for computer sciences and excel in that and go to college. And so it, I think that there was always a spiritual hand at work behind everything that was happening. I just never really understood it. The spiritual practices that I had at the time, I did pray. I would pray anytime I was about to get caught, <laughs> anytime I was about to go to jail. I would pray uh, my way out of any all kinds of situations. But there was a couple of prayers. One was in gratitude. When my uh, mentor first came into my life, he had accidentally left the safe open and I would stumbled upon it and I saw and I opened up the safe and I saw what looked like millions of dollars. It was probably hundreds of thousands and jewels. And, you know, at one point in my life, I would have stole everything in that safe and disappeared, gone to an island or something. And I made a decision in that moment. I said, I'm not going to steal from this guy. Like, no way. I saw it as a test of God and I saw it as an opportunity. I remember I got on my knees and I said, God, if this is my way out of poverty, if this is my way out of the hell that I had come out of, that I will honor this man and I will pay it forward. You know, and so there, there was a lot of spiritual moments around that time, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't really truly have the level of knowing that I have now. I had belief, but not knowing. You know, I feel like when we have this purpose in life, when we have this, you know, tugging at our heartstrings, you know, if you will, where you are right now currently, did you have that feeling, you know, a decade ago when you were at your high of Vicellus and operating in that position? Did you go, I really need to shift where I'm at in my life and, and this is what's really calling me. There's a there's a pattern that has always been there, a pattern of leadership. But I think that I 
got caught up in material pursuits. I got caught up in ego. I got caught up in a lot of other things too. The pattern was always there that I was there to help people and to lead people. But I didn't really understand that leadership is a spiritual gift. I saw leadership as something that I had evolved to intellectually or evolved to as a result of my status and symbols and money. I didn't realize that leadership is a spiritual gift. And that gift has been with me ever since I was young. And when I was in a gang, I was a leader in the gang. There were times where I would give rally speeches and I reflect on it now. And I was like, I've been a motivational speaker for a long time. So there's some spiritual gifts that I had had in me that society will tell you, oh no, you're just good with, with words or you're a good salesman. And they'll label you and then you buy into those labels and you don't really understand the spiritual importance of the gifts because you accept the labels that people place on you. Oh, for sure. I can only imagine though that the, the trials and triumphs that you've been through your entire life have really just set you up perfectly for what you've experienced the last few years. Because you know now you're put in a position to where I oftentimes feel like our suffering beautifully puts us into this transformational period that we come out even more beautiful than ever before. You know, had yeah. you not gone through the contrast of what you've experienced and been able to step into where you're at right now, I, I just feel like it just almost intensifies it and deepens that experience as a whole. Yeah. I tell people that I wish human beings would wear the battles that they've fought like a general does. Yes. You know, you see these generals and every battle they've gone to, they're highly decorated and they wear them all over themselves proudly for the battles that they've, you know, they fought. Not just the ones that they've won, but the ones that they fought. And I think as human beings, we should be proud of the battles we fought. But unfortunately, our society labels you. And so I work with a lot of addicts and I say, are you kidding me? Like you beat something when you beat addiction or when you get 30 days sober, like you beat something that some people never come out of. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to having shame or guilt because you went to jail. You should be proud. Like you did time and you got out of there and you made it out alive and you made it out as stronger with greater character and greater competency as a result of it. And so unfortunately though, society likes to attach you know, shame and, and guilt onto people. And what we don't realize is the person who has to put a lot of effort into their spirituality is actually creating more spiritual warfare against the negative forces than the person who has to put no effort into it at all. So for everybody out there that is having to put a lot of effort to maintain their spiritual practices, to maintain their connection to the creator, to be the best version of themselves that they possibly can be, those people putting a ton of effort in are actually doing more warfare than the righteous person who puts very little effort in. Absolutely. So here you are. You have undergone an intense evolution, you know, from having the fastest growing company on the New York Stock Exchange to living the rock star life to losing it all to going through an incredible hero's journey to letting it all go the cars, the jet, the decadent lifestyle, and now to a life committed to transformation and growth in spiritual practices and a faith filled life that you live currently. If you could kind of just take us through the transformation process, what I see a lot is very common is that a lot of people want to go through this transformational period, but it becomes very difficult because of their old story, because of the attachments they had, you know, those toxic entanglements. So it's really scary because a lot, oftentimes they have to let go almost of everybody to cut that cord, to sever it. And I always say like sever it with love because you want to step into this next chapter, this next life that's pulling at you to come into. If you could kind of take us through that transformation process and what that looked like and how you were able to overcome the naysayers, the the pushback that you received, I'm sure, which was a lot. Well, you know, I went through a, a very difficult time. My mother had been in a difficult situation as a result of alcohol. She had fallen down a flight of stairs. My mentor had just uh, passed away unexpectedly. She took it really hard, got, you know, really drunk and fell down a flight of stairs, was in a coma for two years, and then was severely handicapped for another four years. And so for about a total of seven years from my mentor passing away to my mother's transition, I was uh, dealing with trauma every single day. And and I would wake up every day wondering if, you know, today was the last day that I would uh, have my mother on earth. And so that built, that built up a lot of pressure. And the way that I handled that pressure was I numbed it. I numbed it with alcohol. I numbed it with pursuing ego-driven activity. I numbed it with decadent lifestyle. I, I numbed it in every way you can imagine because I was in pain if I went to see my mother and I was in pain if I didn't go see my mother. So I couldn't win. I couldn't have the conversations I wanted to have with her. I couldn't have the love that I wanted to have with her in the way that I knew love 
love at the time. It was um, seven years worth of just pushing all of my emotions down as deep as I possibly could. And when she passed away, I had a spiritual intuition that it was going to happen. And so I started a process where I started talking to her about the challenges that I was having, the sins that I was I was committing. And I started telling her that, mom, when you go to the other side, you're going to be my angel. And I won't do the things that I'm doing right now because I won't do them if you're in the room. And we made a deal, a soul deal that she was going to transition and I was going to become the leader that I was destined to become. The moment that she transitioned, I started to have spiritual gifts, started to receive messages. I started to experience another realm is the best way I can describe it. And that rattled my cage because I had read about the other realm. I'd read about, you know, these, these cliches, like they're always with you and people saying these things. But now I could feel my mother's presence with me. I could experience the spiritual realm because I had someone who loved me so deeply on the other side, doing everything she could to try to console me and my terrible grief that I had. It was beyond any type of grief that I could describe because I had such a tremendous love for her. And so when people don't understand this, I just try to explain it to them. Like imagine having one of the deepest loves that you've ever had that was unexpressed, that was, you know, un unre resolved in total turmoil my entire life, but total deep love. And then seven years of repressing that love and numbing that love. And then all of a sudden she transitions and it's as though she goes to the other side and she starts doing a alchemy in me and starts surfacing all the dark in me. My ego basically died because I knew my mother could see every sin that I had committed. So I knew that she knew the truth of who her son really was more so than anyone else. And I didn't like the man that I was looking at in the mirror. I didn't like the man that she came to know when she transitioned. And so I had to change a lot of very deep, fundamental, foundational things about me that weren't uh, developed in me as a child. No one taught me morality. No one taught me integrity. In fact, they taught me the opposite of it. They taught me, was actually rewarded to lie. It was rewarded to steal. It was rewarded to do drugs and deal drugs and to live a criminal lifestyle. And I had that in me, although very successful, I never really cleaned that and purified that. I just transmuted that into making money. And then when my mother passed away, I didn't didn't care about money anymore. I cared about, you know, who I was as an individual and the man that I was in total grief. So I believe that she went to the other side, got an assignment from God, and then said, I'm going to try to be the mother that I couldn't be when I was alive so that my son can have a shot at being the man that he came here to be. That's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. That gives me goosebumps because I do believe that. I believe oftentimes we do get more strength from the, our loved ones that pass on. And yeah. I know I do feel that with my dad. That's amazing. So what year was this when she, when she transitioned? So it was 2017. And when that happened, strange things started happening. Uh, random neighbors sue me out of nowhere. Another neighbor goes insane and starts knocking on my door at all hours and files a frivolous restraining order against me. I had like a billion dollars of lawsuits hit me all at once. It was total spiritual warfare. I was in the deepest grief ever. The people that I loved the most were attacking me. Strangers were suing me. And I was like, wow, this is a pattern that I've never uh, experienced before. And the common denominator in all of the negativity was me. Mm -hmm. And so I looked myself in the mirror and I said, like all of these random strange things are happening to me. I got to change me. And I made a commitment to God in that moment that I was going to bring in as much light as I possibly could. I'd heard about this concept called light, that a person emits light, that a person could have so much light within them that they could be anointed by God. They glow that when they walk into a room, good things happen. And I knew about it conceptually. And I said, okay, I'm, I was privileged enough to have a beautiful home, beautiful environment. I had a person to help take care of me and cook for me and things like that. And so I said that I was going to make it my full-time job to learn how this thing called the light works and to try to bring as much of that into my life as possible. And I treated it as such. I spent, you know, minimum of 14 hours a day just doing deep work for, you know, years straight. And I've continued that practice, although don't have to do as much deep work because I've healed a lot of the fundamental things, but there's always more that we find. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in more in maintenance mode. And so I do a couple of hours of deep work per day where before, you know, I had to do 14 to 16 hours of healing a day. I mean, rightfully so. You're just reprogramming your entire human experience, you know. Yeah. So what what's one thing that really stood out that worked for you when you were going from that real devastated low to getting you at least above water? 
meditation and connection to nature, I would always pray. Prayer is one component of a spiritual practice. And unfortunately, in most traditions, they teach you as, as though that that is the only component that you need in the spiritual practice. But prayer is, you know, is uploading and, and meditation is downloading. And you need to have both being able to speak to God and hear God, right? So prayer, meditation, breath work. But the one that I fell in love with that was surprising, and I practice it to this day, is, is singing. I started doing vocal work and learning to sing. And I had no musical aptitude. I couldn't discern a note. I was, you know, I, I'd never had any desire to learn an instrument or music. But in this period of time, I got a calling and I was told that I'd, I was going to become a singer. And I was like, what? I'm going to become a singer? <laughs> And then the next day, I was obsessed at that time with the song by Whitney Houston that it was called I Will Always Love You. And it reminded me of my mother and my childhood youth, and I just would play it on repeat. And after I heard the word that I was going to become a singer, uh, a friend reached out to me and said, I want to introduce you to Whitney Houston's vocal coach. And I said, this has got to be a sign. And so I met with him, wow. got some exercises from him. And now I've been training for the past uh, several years now to be a singer. That's incredible. I did not know that about you. Yeah, See, oh, I love it. YouTube doesn't share everything. So <laughs> that's incredible. And so you didn't have any talent whatsoever. You literally started from not being able to carry a tune to now you're actually yeah. able to. Yeah, I, yeah, and it was interesting. There's a myth that you either are born with it or you're not. Mm -hmm. You know, the process that I've gone through is totally transformed. One of the practices that I teach and that we utilize at our events and retreats is called sound sound healing. And mm -hmm. many people have probably seen it. You have sound bowls and, and that's receiving sound frequencies from the outside end. But when you learn to sing, you're actually generating those frequencies from the inside out. Singing uh, in harmony with another person is actually very healing. It boosts the immune system. It's, it's magical to be synchronized with another human being. And so as I started to explore my voice and explore my throat muscles and, and the art of singing, my whole life changed. That was one of the biggest uh, changes. And I teach a lot of men that, you know, they have no musical aptitude, no desire to sing. And I'm like, we're going to sing together. And, and uh, next thing you know, I'm singing with, with people that I've never sang before. And they're getting to feel the joy of carrying a note in harmony with another person. And I love doing that with people. Oh, I love that. I'm going to sign up for an altar call event just specifically because of that. Because I, yeah, yeah I can't carry a tune either. It's not a good sight. Or... You have a beautiful voice though. So I, I wouldn't have thought that. So maybe I can learn it. Okay. Yeah. That's oh, you can. <laughs> You can. Yeah, I always feel like dancing is such a great way to, you know, movement of your body just to let that energy flow as well. I was in total isolation for two years prior to COVID. So when COVID hit, I was ready. I was like, this is great. Like, I just get to extend my practices. I put a basketball court in my living room. I put a full martial arts studio in. I went to the music store and I bought every instrument that you could imagine, thinking that maybe I'd, you know, pick up an instrument and I I didn't. I picked up sound bowls and things like that, but I didn't pick up the violin or the sax or any of these other instruments that I was called to buy. And I just kept going deep until I realized that I'm supposed to figure out the this instrument here. And as men, you know, we are more revered for putting thousands of hours into building our biceps. And the most powerful muscle that we have in our body is our throat, it's our voice. And yet men don't build their voices, they build their bi biceps. And that's one of the problems that we have in our society right now. Clearly, you can feel that for sure. Can you bring us into the altar call experience for a moment? This was uh, created from you and another that's also a Christian. Is that yeah. correct? I'm Christian. I was raised from a, a devoted Christian mother. And it's interesting because back then it was very almost like blasphemous, not necessarily my mom, but a lot of people when you would talk about spirituality practices, it was almost like shunned down upon. So I love the fact that you, you know, incorporate so many different members from all walks of faith and life. And how, do, how does that work? If you can kind of just give us a clear picture of that. You know, you can't see it, but behind me is a picture of Jesus. I wish, I wish I could pan out, but I think that the modern Christian movement has got it all wrong. I think that we are supposed to be an example and embody Christianity in such a way that other religions and faiths want to do life with us because they're like, wow, these people have light. These people are doing things. These people are not judgmental. You know, they're not being egotistical. They're not being divisive. Many Christians only want to talk to other Christians. And it's like, yeah. that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to reach out and 
you know, and, and be disciples. So I invite all faiths to my event and I lead people to Jesus by way of my personal faith, because when they see the miracles that are happening in my life, they see my transformation physically, mentally, and spiritually, they're going to ask me, how are you doing it? And I can point to them the methods that I utilize. Meditation is mentioned in the Bible something like 23 times. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of, you know, many Christians will say, oh, meditation is wrong. And it's just, yeah. uh, the, the modern church is so in fear. And that's why in America in particular, the membership is declining because it, we should be the most fearless people out there. Because if we truly are protected, we should not be afraid by being in the company of people that have other faiths. It's so refreshing to hear that. I relate to that. I've, I've always had an issue with religion per se. We're supposed to lead by example. We're supposed to show through our actions, you know, and not have like to castrate people who can't, you know, be a part of the faith. So I love that you do that. What is what does the altar call experience look like? Altar call is is was a name that was given to me in prayer. The idea is to alter people's lives so that they can answer their calling. We have a team of about 30 people right now, including coaches that are dedicated to serving our clients, which are primarily primarily leaders and entrepreneurs, and every entrepreneur has to be a leader of some sort in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So we work with leaders, we do leadership development, and a lot of deep work. And the type of leadership development that I do is biblically centered myself. So I'm speaking about the principles and practices that I've learned by way of my own personal study. And then the modalities that we practice, if you're a Christian, you're doing them with the Christian spirit. Mm -hmm. If you're a Muslim, you're doing them with the Muslim spirit. It's like we can, right. we can do breath work and prayer and hike together and, and, you know, and eat together and, and share together. And when I pray to my faith, you know, I, I end it by, uh, saying in the name of Jesus. And when you end it, your prayer, you can end it by saying in the name of whoever you'd like to say it to. And if you want to pray with me and connect to my faith, I embrace that, right? So I prayed with over 20,000 people through altar call. We do do some experiences. We'll go out to the desert and the mountains and we'll get up there with about 30 to 50 of us and we'll go deep into prayer. And my mission is to bring the Holy Spirit into business. And so when I give a speech at a conference or when I'm asked to go anywhere I go, I I, 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 you know, humbly get on my knees. I seek God's protection. I seek the Holy Spirit's grace. And then I try to be a vessel that the Holy Spirit can work through in the room. That's basically my mission on this earth. And the people that I do that with are business people, which tend to be really afraid these days. It's surprising to mix spirituality and business together. And to me, if you're not mixing your spirituality with your business, then you are compartmentalizing your life in such a way that you will be miserable because your business is a reflection of your spirit in the marketplace. And I think that the best way to do life is to integrate the two. Yes. And spirituality gives a business soul. You yeah. know, it leaves a greater legacy. And I believe in heightened, deeper connection that creates stronger unity. So it's beautiful that you're doing this. And I know you're touching so many lives, clearly. I'm always writing uh, books and I'm always writing and creating content. That's a part of me that happens every single day, no matter what. what what's next for me is grow in my ability to lead and to lead millions of people to a deeper understanding of their soul, a greater relationship and connection with the creator, and to be of more service and more good in humanity. The way that I'll do that is by every single day, increasing my competency and character and faithfulness. And I, where I'm at now in my personal spiritual journey is I'm really focused on doing my best to, to um, uh, bear the fruits of the spirit and to really go deep into those biblical fruits of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and uh, self-control and gentleness. I think, I think I got all nine of them. And, and that's just really what I ask myself every day is, did I, did I increase my, my vibration and frequency into the fruits of the spirit? Well, it shows. And, uh, and I, I love what you're doing. I think it's incredible. How can people find you? So is it just on Instagram and your website primarily? Yeah, if you go to altercall.com, you can find me there. And if you DM me on Instagram, I'm always up for a conversation. I'm at real Ryan Blair on Instagram. Ryan, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you. your time today. And I still have a million more questions for you down the road if you, if you ever have the time to come back on. But I'd love to. I'd love to. For today, I think I'll just, I'll let you cool off too. I know that you're probably still <laughs> I'm fine now. I'm fine oh, yeah. now. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I could go another four or five hours. <laughs> I do have one more question for you real okay. quick though, actually. I'm curious. I have a lot of people I know that are experiencing this right now in their own transformation and transition. Do you have to take any extreme measures to block people, change your number and things like that? That's one question I did want to ask you because sometimes it has to be so severe in order for you to drown out the noise so you can focus on your journey. Yeah. The, the best way that I could describe it is when you start to spiral and you're heading toward that rock bottom, the rock is God, right? That's, that's what the rock is on rock bottom. It's God. And so we're going there to meet God and we might have to lose our money and our marriage and our health and our house. We might have to lose all kinds of stuff to go meet God. Now, when a person's on that, on that spiral, if I can get them to meet God quicker, they don't have to lose everything to get there. I didn't necessarily lose everything. I lost a lot because I needed to keep learning. But once you meet God at that bottom, that rock bottom, then you can start to rebuild. But what most people do incorrectly, they try to rebuild it back the way it was. You know, they were on top of a mountain, they go down to rock bottom and they just keep thinking about the old mountain that they were on. And they're like, I want to get back to that marriage. I want to get back to my old house. And God is calling you to a new way of living. And so you have to pick up the pieces differently. And some of the things that you have to pick up differently are your friendships. You know, your, it might be your entire connection to your sexuality, or you might have to uh, not pick up alcohol or not pick up pornography or not pick up marijuana or whatever it is that you, you're not supposed to pick up. So that way you can live a new way in a new life. God is calling you to live a new way. Most people go back to the old way because they're in the valley and they don't know that on the other end of this valley is an even better mountain than the one that they were, they were just on. And so now having gone through this process and having mentored a number of people through the process, you know, yes, you have to take drastic measures. And the more of them that you take on your own accord, the less that God has to do it for you. When God has to do it for you, when suffering comes, it comes to teach you something. It's the best teacher that we can learn from. And so it's better for you to self-inflict some wounds and, and to go and, and make some hard decisions rather than have to have God do it for you and prolong the process to rock bottom. You want to get to that place where you get to know God so you can start to rebuild a new way of being, one that brings God very close to your heart, one that is of service to humanity, one that embodies the fruits of the Spirit. And if you do that, then, you know, on the other end of it, the mountain is even better than the one before it. Well said. So rip that Band-Aid off and let go and let God. Yeah. That's really it. One last question. What's your favorite Bible verse? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil is the one that I remind myself because I am called to serve people that are dealing with uh, darkness. And there are negative entities and dark forces at work in people's lives. And I've had them at work in my life and I've found ways to expel them. And so oftentimes I am called to help people do that within their lives. And so I remind myself of that, that every single day I need to humble myself, ask God for protection and go do spiritual warfare. And, and one thing I'll share with everyone is every act of obedience that you do is an act of spiritual warfare. So keep doing it, keep being obedient and keep, you know, your prayer rituals, you know, keep uh, leading other people to the word. You know, every time you do that, it's an act of spiritual warfare. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you and your time. I will be, I'll be in touch soon and hopefully be at another event of yours in the near future. I know you're doing Sedona here in a couple of weeks. Is that yeah. next, next week actually, isn't it? Yeah. I'd love to have you. You're, I could tell your energy would just completely vibe with us. I cannot wait. I would have been there had I not had to go to Tennessee next weekend. Yeah. yeah. And next week we leave to go to Tennessee. That's where my dad's from. And so we're going to yeah. have his burial there and then we'll circle back. Then I have a retreat in Sedona the 28th and 29th that yeah. I'm hosting with my Reiki master and sound healing lady that I use here in Arizona. So yes, the next one you have, I'd love to, I'd love to be a part of it. So I love that. I love that. Well, I definitely love to meet you in person. And, you know, I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Likewise. Thank you, Ryan. Make it a Thank beautiful you. night. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>